Hello and welcome to MBCF at Home. We're so glad you could join us tonight. Later on, we're going to be exploring the significant role that you can play. Yes, you can play as part of our church community. So if you want to find out what that is, then please do stick around. But in the meantime, grab yourself a cuppa and come back and join us here in just a minute. Well, welcome to our online service. It's great to have you with us today. Uh, we have people who follow us online and are part of our online community. We have those who meet at North Berwick High School at 10.30 on Sunday mornings. Either way, we're just glad to have you with us. If you're watching online and you haven't yet said hello to us, uh, then please do drop us an email. We'd love to meet you, get to know who you are, uh, and any way we can pray for you or support you. So do just drop us an email. Don't be, don't be scared. We're very friendly people. We're going to have a time of worship now and then we're going to uh, listen to our talk today exploring how everyone gets to play. So before we do that though, we're going to, I'm just going to read a little bit of a psalm to us as we go into our time of worship. So just use, encourage you just to use this psalm to just help you engage in worship and to orientate your heart towards God uh, as we come and lift him up in praise. It says this in Psalm 66. Shout for joy to, the, to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done, his awesome deeds for mankind. Yeah, God, we praise you today and, and we lift you up in this place. We want to adore you and we are ready to meet with you uh, and to know you better today. Amen. Let's worship together. Peace. 
So I used to play uh, football a lot, particularly when I was in uh, primary school. Uh, it kind of faded off towards high school, uh, but in primary school I would basically get home from school, rush out, find my friends, go and play at the local park. Football, football, football. I've never been a huge football person in terms of supporting teams, like, so if you start a conversation with me about uh, what's happening in the English Premiership, I'll probably be like, Phew. but I used to enjoy playing it a lot. Uh, and uh, I was never the world's greatest footballer, you know, I would never claim to have been uh, the, the, the world's greatest footballer. I kind of saw myself as somewhere in the middle, you know, I wasn't, definitely wasn't the worst, definitely wasn't the best, but, you know, I, I, was, I was a good midfielder, I could, you know, I could hold my own. Um, and I remember I'd, I even got to play for the school team, but guess what? I never got to play a single game. Boo. But guess what? I got a medal, and I never even played a single game. So that was... Uh, now, I think it was a stitch-up because uh, it was one of the parents that ran the, um, the team, and it happened, just happened to be all this parents' kids' friends that got selected for the team every week. I think it was a stitch up, but anyway, got a medal. But one of the things that used to always happen on those kind of like kickabout games was like, how do we pick teams? Uh, how do you pick teams? And so what usually happens is you'd pick captains, which were nearly always the best players, weren't they? It's, you know, pick the two people to pick teams. And then you'd all stand there in a crowd waiting to be picked. And, and many a, a childhood uh, trauma has been generated in these moments of, when will I get picked? Uh, will I get picked? And, and nobody wants to be the last person because the last person isn't picked. It's just, well, I guess you're on my team, isn't, aren't you? And so it was that kind of, I, I'm sensing there might be some hurts in the room here. Uh, I'm just bringing them to the surface so God can heal them. Um, but it was, nobody wanted to be the last person standing, you know, and, and that feeling of like, where do I fit in the pecking order? And, you know, I was quite happy to be somewhere in the middle because you would usually get picked just before the end, you know, it was good. But how have you felt about your faith? Do you ever look around at the people around you and think, oh gosh, they're better than me? They seem so gifted, those people next to me. They seem so... Uh, they find it so easy to be a Christian. They pray the best prayers. If you ever listen in to someone else's prayers and you go, oh, that was a really good prayer. I know we're not meant to judge prayers, but that was a good prayer. And they seem to have something really special to offer, whereas I'm just your regular kind of Christian. I'm just the, uh, you know, I read my Bible sometimes. I show up on a Sunday. There's nothing special about me. So I'll, actually, I'll just let other people speak up or serve or use their giftings. After all, preferring others is exactly what Jesus would do, right? We've all been there. We've all had those moments where we felt like we're the last person to be picked. Or those moments where we feel like, I don't know what I have to offer. We feel surplus to requirements. Today I want to explore what the Bible has to say about the role that we all play as individuals within the church. Now, John Wimber, who was a great man of God and the founder of the Vineyard Movement, if you're aware of that movement of churches, is credited with this phrase, everybody, everyone gets to play. And uh, such was the power of this simple phrase that it, gradually, after he spoke it so many times, everyone gets to play, it became one of the Vineyard values. And it remains that to this day. It's still one of the Vineyard values for churches across the world, is everyone gets to play. And it's a shorthand way of saying that to be the church is to recognize that everyone gets to play a role. There's not one person who gets to sit on the sidelines. And more than just an attempt to be inclusive in this kind of politically correct world that we're in, or simply a nice idea, this is actually an invitation for all of us today. And of course, it wasn't John Wimber's idea. This is just the way he helpfully articulated it. It's found throughout the Bible, and it describes the role of our church community. So we're going to explore just two words that I think kind of help capture the pictures of what the Bible says about our role uh, as part of a church community. So the first word is priesthood. So in the Old Testament, we have the idea of the priest. 
And of course, it was the descendants of Aaron, uh, their primary role. The, the, of course, you, you read it and you read about all they had to do in the temple, but the primary role the priests were given was to minister to the Lord. So when you read about what happened, the priesthood in the Old Testament, of course, they had certain duties they had to perform uh, that, so that they could enter the tabernacle and the temple. They would maintain things. They would took part in the sacrifice and ritual system that took place. And obviously amongst them was a high priest who was specially anointed, who could go into the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctuary, where the presence of God was, but only once a year. And these priests had to be from that same lineage. They had to be uh, descendants of Aaron. And they had to be anointed by God for this special role. They were chosen and special people. However, we read even very early on as this new role is kind of been uh, put out to Israel that this wasn't actually God's eternal plan that there would be this special group of people. In Exodus 19 verse 5 and 6 it says, although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. So right there back at the beginning in Exodus, we get God's heart which is to say that that actually there's this there's this special group that are priests but my heart is that there's going to be a kingdom of priests so God desired an entire people who would be peace not just Aaron's descendants and we know of course on this side of the cross that when Jesus came he made a way for all of us to enter into the presence of God not something we should take lightly or uh, just flippantly a real honor, but it was open to all. Jesus fulfilled this prophetic word about a kingdom of priests. And we read that, of course, in First Peter. First Peter 2.9, which I think we have on screen. It says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Such a good verse. It's one of my favorite verses. And I actually, I've got a custom guitar strap here that somebody made for me, and it says, declare the praises, uh, because I just love that whole, that whole verse. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. So here, Peter's speaking to the entire church community, and what he's saying is that you guys are now this, this kingdom of priests, you and I. We are now a chosen people, a royal priesthood. We are kings, and we are priests which is quite a thought. I don't know if you thought of yourself as a priest. I don't know what comes to mind when you think of that, being a priest. And this simple truth, of course, has been fought over greatly within the last 2,000 years of the church. A large part of the Protestant Reformation was the recognition that, um, that there was this priesthood of all believers. Christians no longer needed the priest or the minister in order to mediate their relationship with God. People, thanks to the printing press in large part, were starting to be able to read the Bible for themselves for the first time, which just blows my mind when we think about where we are today, where the Bible in however many translations is on my phone. And it blows my mind that for um, you know, 1,500 years, people didn't have access to the Bible like we do. They were entirely dependent on what the person on Sunday said. What a lot of pressure for the person on Sunday. <laughs> but they no longer needed the word of God to be mediated to them. Every believer has complete access to God and to his truth. This is good news, right? And, and it's good news for Joe and I as well because <laughs> it means you don't need Joe or I or any other church leader or priest. You can have a relationship of God that doesn't go through us. Hopefully you see that as good news. We see it, certainly see that as good. That sounds like a lot of work if it depended on us. You can know God for yourself. You have access to God. You don't have to go through a leadership structure to know God. You are as much a priest as anyone else in this room. And this is, the, this is what's called the priesthood of all believers, which is just a very fancy way of saying everyone gets to play. And this has a profound impact on what it means to be a church community. Of course, there's still a need for leaders, thankfully, um, there's still a need for leaders. We see in the New Testament the model of leaders 
But their role is different. It's not to be like the leaders in the Old Testament that mediated the relationship with God. Leaders should never stand in the way of you and God. They never restrict or have any responsibility for your connection to God. Rather, they stand alongside you, support you in your own individual relationship with God. They seek to encourage you to steward the community that we have for the benefit of everyone. It's a very different way of leading. And we hope as leaders that we can be a support and a strength to this community. But it's really, really, really important that your relationship with God doesn't depend on us. And the goal of Sundays is not that you come so that the great wise leader can feed you. If you discovered that the person next to you only ever ate one meal a week, would you be concerned for them? I would be. There's this idea, and it's not completely wrong, but the idea we come to church to be fed. Well, maybe to a degree, but only if it's in the right healthy context. Rather, we gather together to celebrate with one another. We each bring something, is what it talks about in Ephesians. We each bring something to our gathered times. We actually bring strength to this community when we come together. Whether you feel like you do or not, you do. You bring something to this community. Of course, we bring our, it's like bringing food to a banquet, banquet or bringing food to like a bring and share. We bring our worship, we bring our personal relationship with God, our intimacy with the Father, our prayers, our sacrifice, our history with God, our testimonies, our joy, our sorrows, our brokenness, our hurting. We bring our questions, we bring our doubts, we bring our personal history with God and our spiritual life that we cultivate throughout the week. We bring it all and we celebrate it together in community. We are all priests. And that means that we all have a primary focus. And just like the priests in the Old Testament, yes, they had the duties in the temple and all of that to do, but their first and their primary goal was to minister to the Lord. And that is your primary call as well. Beyond anything else that you do, your first and foremost call is to minister to the Lord. What does that mean? Well, most of us probably don't own a temple, uh, we probably don't have a temple to go home and, and, and uh, caretake for. But it means, that this idea of ministering to the Lord is a simple idea. It just means that we live our lives for his pleasure. We live our lives for his pleasure. The things we do, the things that we put our hands to, the relationships we have, the, all that we do, we bring all of it and we live it for his pleasure. It means to live lives of worship to do what we do for God as unto an audience of one. That's what it means to, be, to minister to the Lord, is to make your decisions and to do your life for his glory and for his pleasure. So our main calling before anything else is to minister to the Lord. And of course it happens on a Sunday when we come and we're in an atmosphere of worship and it can be easier on a Sunday in some sense to have that sense that we're all ministering to the Lord but it should be happening midweek as well. It should be happening as part of our daily lives. And, and the idea of um, ministering to the Lord as our primary thing is one of those foundation stones that I think creates a healthy, healthy relationship with God. That we have our, like, it's, like, it's like attending to a king. It's like we, we have our focus on God. And when we have that, it aligns so much more in our lives. So we minister to the Lord. I love that picture. Could go into it more, we don't have time, but we minister to the Lord. We also have the same access to God. And the scripture's full of this. We have the same access to the Spirit. This means that we all have the same potential to hear from God, the same potential to move in the power of the Spirit, the same Spirit that heals and restores. We all get access to the Spirit's gifts and empowerments. We all get to build intimacy with the Father. There is no category of super Christian. Only those who have said yes. There is no category of super Christian. We're not all gifted in the same way, 
yet we all do have the same access to God and his resources. If someone you know hears really well from God, you, you, you listen in and go, wow, they really hear from God. I guarantee you that they didn't just wake up like that one day and just go, oh gosh, I can hear God really clearly now. That's so easy. I guarantee you they've said yes to a journey of listening and hearing and learning. If someone next to you perhaps has a, a great healing ministry and they've seen more people healed than you, again, I guarantee it's very unlikely that they've just woken up one day and suddenly anything they pray for gets healed. Rather, they've said yes to a journey of healing. John Wimber, who I've already mentioned, uh, was known worldwide for his healing ministry. He saw thousands and thousands of people physically healed. But guess what? He prayed for over a thousand people before he even started to see it regularly. A thousand people. I think I would give up after about 50. A thousand people before he started to see it happen. That's someone who said yes. Not because he was some super Christian, not because God specifically said, oh, I, I, I want him to be the superstar of Christianity, but because he's a man who said yes. So the question for us is, what will we say yes to? We have the same access. We have the same resources. What will we say yes to? What are we asking for? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. If we ask for a loaf, he will not give us a stone. And Paul encourages us, particularly in spiritual gifts, to eagerly desire. That means have intention towards. So this is what it means to be a royal priesthood. You and I are all priests. We all get the privilege of ministering to the Lord. We all have the same access to God. There are different gifts, however. And of course, one of the most uh, frequently uh, used scriptures in many charismatic settings is Ephesians 4, where it talks about the gifts of Christ. And it says, so Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And this is sometimes called the fivefold ministry it's uh, referred to. And it says, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So that's Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 13. Now, we often think of these five categories as like, these, these guys really are the super Christians, right? Apostle Neil, sounds very good, doesn't it? You, get, you know, you get the people who literally have it on their business cards. Apostle Neil, I should admit, no, I don't think I'll do that. But we, we go into this and thinking, wow, they're, they're the gifted super Christians. But actually when we read Ephesians 4 in context and we read it and what it actually says, these are actually the ones that are called to lay down their lives for others. The goal of an apostle or a prophet isn't to stand up in front of crowds and wow people with their giftedness. What does it say? To equip his people for works of service. The goal of a healthy prophet isn't that they stand up and they announce great prophetic words for the entire globe uh, and tell us, um, well, I won't mention it, but certain presidents are going to get in and whatever else it might be. That is not the goal of the prophet. The goal of the prophet is to equip the saints for works of service. These aren't super roles. These are the roles that are servants of all. These are the ones that are supposed to give their lives and pour their lives out for the benefit of everyone else. So if you are, if, if a prophet is operating healthily in a community, then it enables everyone else in the community to prophesy better because they're equipping them in their area of gifting. If you have a teacher, the teacher equips people to teach. So actually everyone gets better it's not about these people being on pedestals or whatever. So every one of you is currently in full-time ministry. It's just about where you get your paycheck from. Every single person is in full-time ministry. That's what it means to be a priesthood. There's just some people who, uh, like me, could get paid by the church to do some things. But every one of you is in full-time ministry. But you didn't realize that, but... There you go. An extra job for you. <laughs> Everyone gets to play. Second picture, the body. 
Uh, and I probably don't have time to read the whole passage today, um, but I encourage you to go and read in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, starting at verse uh, 12, I think it is, there's a whole section where Paul talks about the analogy of the body and the church being the body. And it's in the context, actually, of talking about spiritual gifts. It's in the context of how does the Corinthian church steward the gifts that God is pouring out in abundance on the church. So I'll read just a section of it. The whole section's quite long, but uh, verse 12. Just as a body, though, has many parts, but it but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but many. And then he goes on to use all these analogies. He talks about the foot and how every, every part of the body has its unique place to do its own gifting. And he also makes the point that if one part of the body is not functioning well, it actually affects everything. If you've ever had a toothache, you will know how such a small part of your body has the potential to impact everything. And he, he goes through and he talks about how everything is different in the body, but together it forms a functioning body. And we don't want um, the foot to go to sleep because that stops us from walking uh, and we don't want uh, the ear to decide it doesn't want to play its role because then we can't hear and so it's a powerful picture and it's a very simple picture in many ways but it's a powerful one every single part of the body is important you can't run if you've got a sore toe you know it's like we think about the things the small parts of our body you can't run if you've got a sore toe Little parts of the body make a big difference. And NBCF, as a, as a church community, we need everyone who calls this church home to play an active role, to bring their gifts, their, their um, God-given uh, creativity to this church. Not because Joe and I are trying to whip everyone into shape and kind of create an army of volunteers or anything like that, but because if the body is going to be healthy and function, everyone has to play their role. God has uniquely gifted everyone here. You don't get to sit on the sidelines. Even if today you're sitting there going, I don't know what I bring, I guarantee you, you bring something significant. You are vital to the functioning of Christ's body in NBCF and wider than that in North Berwick and East Lothian. And when any one of us doesn't play our role, there is a consequence, there is a suffering that happens. When we hold back, it actually isn't just impacting us. And of course, we all wrestle with the fears and the doubts and the insecurities that hold us back. But not only do they hold us back, but they can hold back the body. For Christ's body to be fully expressed in our region takes you and me. And what I don't mean to imply by any of this that, that Somehow there's a goal that we need 100% attendance on a Sunday or in small groups or any of that. That is not what I'm saying. I'm talking about you playing your role by living out who you are made to be in the place God has got you. It's about us saying yes to a journey of yes, overcoming our insecurities and our fears, learning to value ourselves as God sees us, to recognize the different gifts that the body has we don't have to look alike, we don't have to sound alike, we don't have to think alike, but we are the body and everyone gets to play its part. It's like the beautiful tapestry we call the body of Christ. And of course, along with the body image, we have this idea that Christ is the head. We have the head and the body. And, and I hope it's not blasphemous to say, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the head can't do much without the body. The head can't do much without the body. I mean, roll around. It, it requires the body. And I don't understand why God set it up this way, but he has. He's, he's, he's set it up in such a way that the head requires the body. And of course, the head directs the body. But without the body, what happens? Now, maybe you're sitting there thinking, well, I had no idea what I do. I don't know what my gift is. Am I a foot or an ear or a toe? 
my little bone inside the ear? What, what role do I play? And I can't answer that for you right now. But I do believe that being part of a community, being engaged with other Christians, is a key part of discovering what that is. Learning with one another, helping one another see the gifts in one another. A healthy church is a place of encouragement and strength that goes, I see this gift in you. I see your heart for this. Why don't you bring that? Yes, you feel insecure in that, or yes, you're not sure about this, but I see this in you. God has gifted you in this way. And if you can ask yourself questions. What natural gifts do you have? What things do you find easy that other people around you find really hard? What stories stir you with passion when you hear them? What makes your heart go, oh, either in a good way or in a bad way? What injustices stir you? What brings you joy? What comes easy to you? And your small group would be a good place to explore that if, you, if you're looking for a place to do that. Ask people, what do you see as my gifts? What, what things do I bring to this community? And often, the other thing I would say about finding our area of gifting and stuff is that just start somewhere. My, my journey of finding out where, where I'm good and where I'm strong has been very much a kind of winding path of, I don't know where I'm going, but I'll try this next, and I'll try this next, and I'll try this next. And my experience has always been, it's easier to steer a moving car than it is to, to have a stationary one. So just get, get involved, get serving, get doing something, play your part. And of course, with this, this picture of the body and this picture of the priesthood, it, it's all begging a question that God has a purpose in all of that. He, he wants us to be the body. He wants us to be the priesthood. What would it look like to have a God-sized vision for our church community? How does he see us? What does he call us to do here? And I guarantee that God's perspective on this small church community is a hundred times more glorious than we can currently see. He has plans for us. We are significant in his body. We're not just a small group of friends and family who happen to live in the same area. We are the body of Christ. We are God's glorious bride, his body, his ambassadors, his representatives. We are his glorious inheritance, a city on a hill, a beacon of hope. And as we start to dream with God about what it means for this community to have its impact we should be excited because God has great things for us. And it starts with us all overflowing in our gifts, becoming confident in who God calls us to do and what God calls us to do and who God calls us to be. I remember hearing a story uh, when we were studying over in the States. Uh, the church there, Bethel Church, um, they got a phone call one day from a lady in the community who called them up and said, um, I wonder if you could tell me about your, uh, I'll say shopping mall, that was American, shopping center uh, ministry that you run as a church. Uh, and, and the person was a bit confused on the end of the phone and went, we don't, we don't have a shopping center ministry. We don't run a shopping center ministry. We just have people who shop. And what had happened was this lady had been stalked by someone who just was a Christian going about their shopping, listening to God, heard something, had ended up praying for this lady, and this lady had been so blessed that she hadn't got hold of the person's name or number, just knew what church it was, and so called the church and said, tell me about your shopping mall ministry. And they said, we don't have a shopping mall ministry, we just have people who shop. And I thought that was such a powerful picture of what it is to be the body of Christ. We don't need to have 10 different ministries tackling different things around North Berwick. We just need you and I to be the body of Christ. That you are a priest when you're at the shops when you're, uh, as well as when you're at church. And of course, there's some enemies that we face when we think about these. And we're going to put these up on the screen. Uh, the first one is the enemy of fear. I'm going to look really silly if I step out and use my gifts for God. People are going to make fun of me. Or perhaps it's the fear of being left out, like I, like I said, you know, the, the football analogy. I'm maybe not going to get picked. Nobody's going to actually see that I, what I bring 
Or maybe what I bring isn't valuable. There's a fear thing. Or perhaps it's the fear I'm going to look arrogant. If I stand up and say, actually, I could really bring this to this community, people are going to, and this is a very common one in Scotland, Britain, is who am I to stand up and say, I have something to offer? This kind of Britishness that says, who do you think you are telling me you're gifted? What does God say about us? And perhaps you're excusing yourself, God can't use me, I'm too old, too young, too broken, too ordinary, too guilty, too sinful, the list goes on. Read the stories in the Bible. God uses everyone, anyone. He even speaks through a donkey. If he can speak through a donkey, he can speak through me. So that's the first one, we can be scared. The second one is comparison. Well, that person next to me, they're the really gifted one. They're the one that can really bring something important. They're the real Christians. God's decided to bless them and not me. He's decided those people over there should be blessed. Uh, And this is where we can fall into the trap of this kind of celebrity Christian thing, which unfortunately is falling apart all over the world right now. This idea that we put someone on a pedestal and we say they're, they're the gifted man or woman of God. And what happens, of course, when you put someone on a pedestal, they fall. We need to restore this idea that actually we are all significant in God. It's not about the man or woman of God that that comes and leads us. It's actually, and I've sensed this prophetically and heard this prophetically from other prophetic voices. There's a shift happening in the church away from the the one person who, who holds it and leads it to an army of people, a people who all understand who they are, who are living out their lives. And that's what we need to see. God specializes in using unlikely people like you and me and the person next to you. He's the one that qualifies you. You know, when he calls the disciples, he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I will make you. God was the one that turned them into fishers of men. It wasn't their gifts and abilities. Follow me. That's the bit we say yes to. I will make you into what I need you to be. Follow me. Do you feel uh, weak and foolish? Great. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Do you feel incompetent? Great. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. There are no super Christians, only the ordinary people like you and me who say yes to God. Everyone gets to play. Not one person is surplus to requirements. Not one person gets to sit on the sidelines. And of course, there can be seasons of healing. I want to acknowledge that. There can be seasons of healing. You know, when a football player is injured, he may need to get treatment. He may need to go off the pitch. He may even need to miss a few games. But what happens if that player turns a recovery season into a lifestyle? Well, they begin to lose their health, their fitness. They begin to uh, lose their sharpness in the game. So maybe you are in or have been in a season of healing and recovery. If it's just a season, great. If it becomes a lifestyle, you need to be careful. And perhaps since COVID, you've noticed that, that actually it's time to get back in the game. Because when we're not in the game regularly, we actually, our muscles atrophy. We lose our strength. We lose our sense of what's happening. This could be a good time to remind yourself, what are God's gifts and how can I use them? It's time to get back in the game. And maybe God's calling you to pick up gifts that you've used in the past or explored in the past. We need everyone. We need those with the gifts of hospitality to open their doors again. We need those with the gifts of administration to use their skill for the sake of others. We need those who have gifts in the healing and the prophetic to pick up your gifts and get moving again. Perhaps it's in pastoral. Perhaps it's to care for those around you. We need you to do your part. 
Perhaps it's the gift of giving, then we need you to give. Perhaps it's in leadership, we need you to start leading. Everyone gets to play. You are significant, you matter, your life matters. Everyone gets to play. So what is God saying to you today? Is there one of those enemies he wants you to tackle head on, the the fear or the comparison? Or is it that he wants you to remind you of the gifts he's given you, the things he's called you to? Or perhaps, the other way around, perhaps there's someone in the room today or even in this church community that you need to encourage and go up to them and say, I see this gift in you. How powerful would that be if we started doing that for each other? I see this in you. We are the body and we get to build one another up. We are a royal priesthood and that means we get to live our lives ministering to God. We are a body, which means we get to play our part. Let me pray for us. God, I I thank you for the rich tapestry that is the church community. I thank you, God, that you call everyone to play their part, that there are no uh, people you exclude, God. And I pray that as a community, you'd continue to uh, enable us to be such a welcoming place, enable us to be the kind of place where anyone can walk in and anyone can receive your love and know your church community is a place of hope. But God, I pray for us today. I pray if there's gifts that have... Uh, laid dormant, I pray that you would resurrect them, God. If there are new gifts you want to give today, I pray you would give them. Where we just need confidence, I pray that our confidence would come from you. Where we feel weak, I pray you would cover us in your strength, God. But God, I pray you'd give us a fresh vision of what it means for us all to play alongside one another. To bring all that we have to into, uh, into, into the, the banquet that you're creating here, the, the place of hope, the beacon, God. Like I see a picture of us almost bringing uh, little torches on fire and bringing them in and throwing them into a big bonfire and just seeing this huge, this huge bonfire, this beacon of hope in the middle. And it comes from us all bringing ourselves. So God, I pray that we'd be that kind of church where we are a place of hope, where we are a place where everyone feels valued and everyone can find a place to be involved. Amen. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been great having you with us. Hopefully, uh, as you've listened to our message, you've been inspired to think about the gift that you bring to our community. If you're not sure or you need some help, then please do uh, you know, chat to others within your small group or get in touch with us. We'd love to help you find the role that you can play within our community. But wherever you are, we we pray you know you are significant, that you make a difference, uh, and that God has got you here for a purpose. So we bless you, and we pray you know his hope this week. Amen.